With her reporting, Paula, these bills enormous. What did he ask for? What did he get? He has seven figure legal mm -hmm. debt, Jim. So he and his attorney, Robert Costello, went down to Florida in late April to make their pitch to the former president about why he should help them out. Now we've learned they had multiple meetings and they walked away with some sort of implied assurance of assistance. But, uh, you know, in a very Trumpian way, he did not commit to a specific amount or a specific timeline. But a month after these conversations, a Trump aligned political action committee did pay over three hundred thousand mm -hmm. dollars to settle one of Giuliani's many legal debts. Now, going forward, it's unclear if he's going to get any additional money. We're told as of now he has not received any other assistance. That, that is some, not all, not even half uh, of what, what he owes. If, if it's a seven-figure amount, are there concerns about the consequences of this within Trump world? Yeah, absolutely, mm -hmm. Jim. We've learned that advisors who are close to the former president believe it is in his interest to help Giuliani here and keep him in the fold. They've learned a lot from what happened with Michael Cohen, who, of course, went from being Trump's fixer to being one of his most public uh, critics and provided a lot of information that set off investigations. And when it comes to Giuliani and other people in the inner circle, uh, there are people pressing Trump to, again, keep them close. These folks could potentially, Rudy Giuliani is a complicated witness, mm -hmm. but could potentially be helpful to prosecutors. But at this point, it's unclear uh, the extent to which Rudy Giuliani is going to cooperate in any of these investigations. He is mentioned, obviously he is co co unnamed co-defendant in the federal case and then charged in Georgia. But Jim, when you got this much legal debt and you're not paying it, it's hard to retain and yeah. keep lawyers. So it's unclear if he has a lawyer right now in Georgia. Paula Reed, thanks so much. Boris these developments so why do they believe they have a right to a three-year delay yeah right they're asking for approximately three years mm -hmm. between indictment and trial they argue that they need that time to prepare i've seen them argue in other cases in court for mm -hmm. example in the mar-a-lago case that look they have a lot of cases they have a lot of work um, and they can't do everything at once in their filing they argued quote the government's objective is clear to deny President Trump and his counsel a fair ability to prepare for a trial. The court should deny the government's request. And of course, the government is requesting to take this to trial on January 2nd, 20 day. And she's looking at a calendar that's pretty crowded. You've got the possibility of four criminal trials in addition to civil matters. And I think there is a shotgun on August 28th. Stronger even than the documents case. Yes, mm -hmm. mostly because of the amount of preparation that is needed in a matter that involves classified documents. Yeah. There are a lot of legitimate arguments about mm -hmm. how long it's going to take to go through that discovery. You also, in that case, have a much less experienced judge, Judge Eileen Cannon, who's overseeing the Mar-a-Lago documents case, uh, a Trump appointee. She's only been on the bench a, a, a few years. Where's Judge Chutkin? She's been on the bench for a decade. And Jim, being in court with her for this case, one thing I've seen is she moves quickly. She doesn't allow even short mm. delays. So she seems poised to want to move this along. All right, in Fulton County, we're seeing so many threats yeah. uh, against uh, federal officials uh, or state officials involved, as well as uh, the grand jurors. In addition to those persons' safety, obviously yeah. that's priority, are officials worried about a chilling effect on the justice system? I would imagine grand jurors down the road might say, hey, wait a second, if all my information is going to be out there on a sensitive case, I might face some threats. It's completely reasonable for mm. anyone to think that. This is a quirk of Georgia law, mm. that the names of grand jurors are on one of the first few pages of the indictment. I was actually very surprised to see it the night we were covering the indictment. Uh, we don't see that in the other cases. This is, but this is the way Georgia does this in the interest of transparency. But of course, here there are repercussions. The facts that these people have been doxxed. You have what purports to be their pictures, uh, their addresses out there on the web. And we know that that could have a chilling effect. It was interesting. One of the women who testified in this case, a former Democratic state senator, Jen Jordan, she said outright, she said, look, things like this, this could make it more difficult for prosecutors to be able to seat a trial jury if people are worried yeah. for their safety and that of their families. Now, we've also learned that uh, Fulton County officials have faced threats that we don't have a lot of specifics. They're not sharing a lot of information. And of course, DA Fonnie Willis, who has repeatedly um, been, been uh, criticized by former President Trump's security, has been stepped up at her Georgia residence. Yeah, I spoke to a Republican lawyer yesterday who said that, you know, the, the, as you say, the, those laws were designed for transparency, but they may not match this time. Right? Exactly when, right when the attacks on the system are so frequent 
uh, and often so violent. And uh, some states have an option. Some yeah. states have an option if there's the public interest or security concerns outweigh, right, the need for transparency. And that could have been the case here if they had had that option. Yeah. Paul Reed, thanks so much. Boris.